Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm Jennifer Smith, and I'm a science communicator at Wisconsin Sea Grant. Welcome to tonight's Lake Talk. Tonight, we're focusing on a type of aquaculture or fish farming called Recirculating Aquaculture Systems, or RAS for short, RAS. We've got a great panel of three experts in the field, each with a different approach to this topic, so it should be a great session tonight. Before we get going, I have just a few details to share with you. We have one hour, and that includes time for your questions. You can put your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Also, this is being recorded, so you can watch again later or share it with someone. Uh, we'll post it to the YouTube channel for Wisconsin Sea Grant in the near future. I also wanted to say a few words about Wisconsin Sea Grant. This year, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. If you're not familiar with us already, we're based at UW-Madison, but we also have field offices in various places around the state, including staff in Bayfield, Manitowoc, Green Bay, Milwaukee, Superior, and Kenosha counties. We're part of a national network of 34 Sea Grant programs working on issues related to coastal and marine science. As I mentioned, we have three speakers tonight that I'm really excited about. We have Emma Hauser, Kat Frederick, and Jesse Trushensky. I'll introduce each right before their presentation. Since Emma's going first, I'll tell you a bit about her. Emma Hauser is based in Bayfield, Wisconsin. She's the Aquaculture Outreach Specialist for the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility, NADF, and Wisconsin Sea Grant. She's been with NADF since 2014 and is a graduate of UW Eau Claire in Ecology and Environmental Biology. So without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Emma. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Jennifer, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight on this wonderful St. Patrick's Day. Um, so as Jennifer mentioned, I'm the Aquaculture Outreach Specialist for the Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility, and we're going to be talking more about that facility uh, in a few minutes. But to start off my presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about the basics of aquaculture. So uh, for those of you that don't know that term or if the first um, time hearing the term, it's basically the, the culturing or the rearing of aquatic organisms. So we're going to be talking a lot about the fish today but understand that basically anything you're raising in or around water. So things like shrimp and other crustaceans, um, seaweed or other aquatic vegetation, oysters and other bivalves, even alligators or turtles can be considered aquaculture species. So I'm going to hone in on kind of the, the fish side of aquaculture because that's what we do at the facility and we're gonna be highlighting a little bit more today. So thinking about fish, so why do we raise fish for aquaculture? Well, the most kind of first thought might be for food, right? So food fish aquaculture. Um, but also there's a number of different reasons why we would raise fish. Um, another one would be for the sport fish industry. So there are hatcheries that raise species like walleye, muskies, um, up by where I'm at in Bayfield, Wisconsin, we raise things like brown trout or slake, basically to support the sport fish industry. We raise fish for research. So the facility that I work at, for instance, raises fish to answer different questions, such as what is the correct feed for the species or the optimal environment to raise the species. So we're looking at sustainability, not only environmentally, but economically sustainable. And so there's a number of different questions that we're asking on how to raise these various species. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, bait fish is a pretty large industry, especially for Wisconsin. So Wisconsin is one of the largest bait fish producing states in the Midwest. We raise fish, fish for conservation. So the iconic lake sturgeon here is signifying raising species uh, for conservation to really support their populations. And then the ornamentals. So those of you that have ever had an aquarium recognize the species as the Oscar. So raising fish for the ornamental industry or the aquarium industry. So if you think about it, if you're in Wisconsin, you think, well, maybe, you know, aquaculture isn't a big part of the state, um, but there is over 2000 registered aquaculture farms in Wisconsin, um, supporting all of these industries I just mentioned. So we have a poll for all of you on this call. Um, and if you think about it worldwide, what do you think the percentage of fish and seafood that we eat today is farmed? So um, Jennifer had this great poll up here. So I'm going to ask the group what their thoughts are. I see some answers coming through here. I'll give you another couple seconds.
All right, Jennifer, do you want to share the results of this? So it looks like some people think 5%, some people 10%, others say 50%. So it's really not quite, a lot of people that I talk to are, are unsure of this question, but actually the answer is over 50% of our aquaculture is, or, or fish and seafood comes from aquaculture today. So if you look at the graph here, so back in 2015, aquaculture actually tipped the scale to now over 50% of our fish and seafood are raised for our consumption and wild capture fisheries over the next 50 years is going to stay maybe the same, if not drop off a little bit. And this is a good thing because we have to support the demand uh, for aquaculture for seafood and fish in, in the world. And with our global population increasing, aquaculture has to help meet this demand. So we wanna be able to sustain our wild capture fisheries. So why raise fish for food? Well, there's a number of different benefits for raising fish for food. I am just going to highlight one of these is that fish are very efficient animals. They are very efficient at converting the feed that we give them into their body weight. So when we compare them in, to other animals, other agricultural animals, this graph is showing you in the, the circles here, these, this represents one pound of feed. So how many pounds of feed does it take to feed one of these animals to get one pound of body mass out? So for cattle, for instance, it takes about 6.8 pounds of food to feed that animal to get one pound of body mass out. For pigs, it takes about 2.9 pounds of feed. For chickens, 1.7 pounds. Fish is almost one to one. They are incredibly efficient animals. Um, and this is for more of a salmonid or a trout um, or a salmon fish. But we are getting very, we're getting a lot better at our feeds and, and looking at how to raise these species optimally. But it's an, they are incredible animals at converting what we are feeding them into their body weight. So that is just, just one quick example of why they make such an efficient agricultural animal. So looking at the world and kind of who has all the fish, who's, who's growing fish for food? Um, North America is definitely one of the last ones on the list here. Um, what you see here, most of our fish and seafood is coming from overseas. So unfortunately, over 80% of our seafood is imported into the United States. Um, and that creates a huge trade deficit for us of over $14 billion. And this is the second highest natural resource deficit after oil. So this is why it's so crucial and important to think about growing and building capacity of aquaculture in the United States, not only to help with this trade deficit, but also thinking about local jobs, local economies, and being able to produce fresh local seafood um, right in our backyards versus importing it from overseas. So that's where I'm gonna shift gears here and talk a little bit about the Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility, which is really our mission is to support sustainable aquaculture. And we wanna support it in the Midwest and throughout our partners across the nation. Um, so the NADS facility is a campus of the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, um, but we are a Northern campus. So we're actually four hours North of Stevens Point up here in Bayfield, Wisconsin, um, near Lake Superior here. So we are, promoting sustainable aquaculture through a number of different means. So we have various activities that we do continuously. So we have various outreach extension, training, technology transfer. Um, we're a big proponent of workforce development programs. So getting students interested in this as a future career choice. Um, so workforce development is a, is a large bottleneck for industry expansion right now. So getting kids excited and interested in this is one of our priorities. We also do very applied research and demonstration projects. Um, so this is an example of a salmon project that we are doing. So Kat Frederick, our next um, presenter is gonna be highlighting more about this project. And really our research and demonstration projects are here and are, are you know, sustainable and, and applied because of our cooperative partnerships with a number of different agencies and stakeholders. So we not only work with the private industry, but also state, federal, and tribal agencies. Really, again, to promote sustainable aquaculture, um, best management practices, and really learning how to raise species optimally. So to kind of showcase the facility in a little bit more detail, 
So we have a variety of different systems that support a variety of different species. So we have incubation, larval, and grow out systems um, to raise over 15 different species of fish, fish since we um, opened in 2002. Um, so again, food fish, but also bait fish and conservation species and at various life stages. Um, this is very unique to, to a facility to be able to raise this many species having this many systems to raise this many species as well. So we're going to talk a little bit more about recirculating aquaculture systems in the next talk, but understand we also have these flow through systems called raceways and pond systems. So we're very diverse. And that means that we can be very diverse in our, in our research and our demonstration. And again, we're doing real life application. We're working directly with partners to understand what the problems are, um, learn about the priorities and really enhance sustainable aquaculture. So with that, I wanna say thank you for having me today. Um, this is my contact information. Um, this is our website. We have a number of different information on our website, aquaculture.uwsp.edu. And I'd be happy to answer questions during our discussion time. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Next up, we have Dr. Catherine Frederick, who goes by chat. She's based in Baltimore, where she works with University of Maryland Extension, Maryland Sea Grant, and the Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology. She's got expertise in fin fish aquaculture with a focus on Atlantic salmon and working with the aquaculture industry to build capacity and address bottlenecks. She's an Extension associate whose main responsibility is coordinating and conducting programming across regions with the input and support of salmon RAS experts, Extension specialists, and industry through a consortium known as RAS-N, or the Recirculating Aquaculture Salmon Network. That consortium is entering a major new phase thanks to support from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I know she'll tell you more about that. Kat holds a PhD from the University of Maine in Marine Bioresources and a Master's in Aquaculture from Kentucky State. Welcome, Kat. Hi, thank you. Um, let me just get my presentation up. Going. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Frederick, but I like to go by Kat. Um, let's see, it's not going. Okay. So I'm here today to essentially cover some basics. What is RAS or recirculating aquaculture systems? How does RAS work? And what is the recirculating aquaculture salmon network? Uh, so, sorry. So um, essentially, what are these RAS systems? And as you may have guessed from the image uh, that's kind of playing in the bottom corner there, these are systems that raise fish in a concealed environment where water is filtered and recirculated. As a result, they could be placed on land. And if so, they are referred to as land-based farms. So you might hear an interchange of RAS and land-based farms. And in this case, in this presentation, they are the same. So what is the interest in RAS? First, RAS is water efficient. In most designs, 99% of water is recycled throughout. Uh, the second, uh, RAS prevents disease transmission and fish escapes to wild fish populations because it is fully contained. Um, this also allows us to capture and repurpose waste, which helps to reduce environmental impact of a food system. Third is local production. Uh, there's flexibility with RAS where a farm can be sited. Uh, farms can be located closer to where consumers are, which lowers the economic and environmental cost transportation. And finally, uh, RAS allows us to highly control the rearing environment where we raise the fish. Uh, so that helps us increase fish performance and their welfare. So I'm kind of going to start through the process of a RAS. What are the different components of a RAS system? Um, it's not gonna be very technical, I promise. But first we have our production tank. Uh, this is where fish are grown and housed. And special considerations are always taken into account for their biological needs from the size and shape and construction of the tanks to the stocking rates and life stage and the type of water supply. Um, what you see here in this image is a great example of a grow out lab um, tank that is at the Conservation Funds Freshwater Institute in uh, West Virginia. 
who happens to be one of um, one of our collaborators, which I'll get into in a bit. Second, um, once water leaves that production tank, uh, the first thing you have to do is clean up the water. So in a raft, sy uh, in a raft system, suspended solids like uneaten fish food are removed from the water. And these solids are um, removed to help maintain water quality that is healthy for the fish. Um, so what you see here is an example of such a filter. And this allows water to pass through while trapping and removing those solids. Um, so just think of it as a large, more advanced Brita filter. That's how I like to think of it. Once water is uh, initially screened for those solids, uh, it's pumped further and it undergoes um, further cleaning and conditioning. Uh, so as you can see uh, right over here, you have temperature control and you can adjust the temperatures to the needs of the fish and uh, we can continue to clean that water. So fish don't have the luxury of flushing a toilet like we do. Uh, so to reuse that water, we have to clean it for them. And so we do this by using healthy natural bacteria that removes harmful forms of nitrogen like ammonia. And those bacteria, uh, biofil uh, those bacteria form biofilms um, in these large towers that I've boxed right here for you. Uh, where they can grow on media as water trickles through. And then using the same image, because it was a two for one right here, I've boxed a second component. Um, when we breathe out, in and out in our homes, that CO2 kind of dissipates, so we're not affected by it. It doesn't cause us harm, but fish raised in tanks need a little extra help. Uh, so here, if we recycle the water over and over without doing anything, uh, CO2 will continually increase. So to help keep the fish healthy um, and happy, a degassing column, again, that's boxed right here, uh, just strips that CO2 from the water. And we're also able to just inject um, some, a little bit of oxygen back into the water to help with that too. And finally, after that, the oops, I went back. But finally, um, after that, the water can go back to the production tank and then it just continues that recirculation process. Um, this slide, I wanted to show you something that looked more realistic. The, that was a simple diagram, um, right? We don't have everything stacked next to each other in that circle, um, but here you can have an overview shot of what those uh, systems look like on a commercial facility. Sorry. Um, and so I'd like to highlight now, RAS is an established technology. This has been used for many decades. Uh, we successfully raised these fish for both conservation and food purposes. Here we have two examples, one highlighting uh, its use in conservation efforts. Uh, there's been a big overhaul of the hatcheries in Alaska recently to uh, replace with higher more efficient RAS systems to um, replenish natural stocks out in Alaska. So this is a great example of its use in conservation. And it's also used in food production. In this example, um, we raise salmon to a certain size before growing them out in net pens. Um, so we have a freshwater stage and, and they're raised in that uh, tank, in that RAS system, and eventually moved out to net pens. The land-based technology will combine those two into one facility. And further, uh, you might have even enjoyed the technologies provided by RAS. Aquariums um, up here, you can see the whale sharks hanging out. Uh, those use RAS technologies to maintain artificial environments for public viewing. And a number of species are already raised in these systems to have produce food. Uh, I've included some examples like shrimp, we grow eel. Um, this is a team in Maine that is trying to uh, develop uh, an eel production facility um, in the state of Maine. And uh, something that's really interesting, uh, we, I don't know how many of you might know this, but we produce um, horseshoe crabs in RAS facilities because their blood is so unique. Um, it coagulates when exposed to bacteria, harmful bacteria. So we use them to test medications and biomedical devices um, to make sure they're contaminant free. And so efforts to raise them in rats um, 
are increasing um, so that we can reduce pressure on wild populations of horseshoe crab. So a really cool, interesting example of RAS um, in use. Um, so why am I here today? Well, very re recently in the US, we have witnessed a strong interest in developing these RAS facilities to grow out Atlantic salmon fully on land. So instead of dividing between net and pen, it's all in one contained facility. Uh, this map is showing just a few of the projects in the works. Uh, since 2020, this is when that map was produced with data that the number of proposed facilities have only increased. Um, here in like uh, where you're located in Wisconsin, there is a facility already up and running called Superior Fresh. I'm sure some of you are very familiar with their product, but they grow Atlantic salmon at a smaller commercial scale. And comparatively, the projects shown on this map are much larger in scale. Let's see. So why does that matter? Why is that scaling? Um, why am I mentioning that scaling? Well, when you scale up and increase the intensity of a, any system, um, you're going to introduce new biological, engineering, and technological challenges. I also um, noted here that the marine water component is also a new challenge for this uh, land-based production. And that's because uh, we now have to deal with salts and, and how to, and how to uh, you just have to handle salts. I'm so sorry. Um, and as industry increases commercial production, um, it has to be able to identify and address those bottlenecks. Uh, so to succeed, you need to eliminate or reduce those bot um, bottlenecks to production. In other words, you can't go faster than your bottlenecks. And so this is where I come in. Um, I am an extension agent working with the Recirculating Aquaculture Salmon Network. Um, this is a fully integrated research extension, outreach education, and workforce development that was created in 2019 fully funded by the National Sea Grant Office as a collaborative hub. The goal is to provide broad support and to build capacity of this new industry by identifying the most critical bottlenecks. And these bottlenecks, identifying them, um, have been informed by industry and community stakeholders in a multi-regional effort. So our big players are coming out of Maine, Maryland, and Wisconsin. And on this map here, you can see that out of Wisconsin, where you might have some interest, um, we have Riverance, Superior Fresh, and where Emma um, works out of uh, Stevens Point, the um, NADF. And as we continued our work in identifying these bottlenecks, we kind of made some waves. So new partners and supporters have been gradually added to the network. This is really cool for us. Um, it just further diversifies the input that we're receiving and it allows us to increase the collaborative nature of this hub and network. Um, I don't have time to go into all of the activities that we do, but the success of this is demonstrated um, through a number of larger activities we do. Um, these on the left, you see some outreach mechanisms. I didn't include survey work. So in addition to the workshops and special sessions, We've also done um, surveys to really connect with our stakeholders and to identify the highest of pri um, priorities from the perspectives of commercial industry, suppliers, RAS experts, researchers, government agencies, and more. Um, I really can't emphasize enough how many hands are involved. And it shows because at the end, we were able to identify some major areas. And this is more of a visual. I don't want to. Um, I don't think I have time to go through everything, but I will point out that optimizing the engineering and the RAS components are um, one of those priorities, as well as um, improving water reuse and waste removal. And the importance of this um, network was the identification process, but what do you do after you identify? Um, you just put, you know, you don't wanna just put it on paper and say, hey, this is what it is. We wanna be proactive with that information. And so what we were able to do was take that information and spawn a new project called the Sustainable Aquaculture Systems Supporting Atlantic Salmon. It's a mouthful. Um, so we just call it SAS squared for fun. 
Uh, <laughs> In this program, we are now addressing those identified bottlenecks through research efforts, educational programming, and extension efforts. Um, and we've only increased that network even more. It's now um, international. We've brought in um, marine research institutes from other countries, and it's just really growing. Um, to me, it's honestly a beautiful example of how collaboration and communication between public, private, and government entities can lead to research and solutions. And I'm really pleased to be part of both projects. And so with that, um, I will answer any questions at the end, but I do wanna recognize the lead PI on both projects, Dr. Jonathan Zohar. He's out of the Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology as well. I'm trying to figure out how to stop. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Kat. Thanks for that really big picture look at this very large collaboration that you're working with. You know, seeing your slides again just kind of reminded me how many different partners are involved. So you definitely have a very busy job wrangling all of that. Um, now we're going to turn to our final speaker, who is Dr. Jesse Trushensky, who's a fishery scientist with a focus on conservation and commercial aquaculture. She's the chief science officer and vice president for animal welfare for River Rents the largest producer of farmed rainbow trout and steelhead in the Americas with operations in Washington and Idaho. She manages research and development there and provides scientific leadership across the company's operations. Jesse also leads North American research and development for STEM, a Norwegian company providing fish health products, veterinary and environmental services to the Atlantic salmon aquaculture industry worldwide. Whether it's fish nutrition, physiology or health, Jesse has always been driven by the practical application of science. Before she joined the private sector, she was an associate professor, professor excuse me, at Southern Illinois University and a fish pathologist supervisor for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. She's filled numerous leadership roles within the fisheries and aquaculture communities. Among those, Jesse is a past president and fellow of the American Fisheries Society, and she was recently appointed to serve as a member of the National Fish Habitat Board. So now I'll hand it over to our final speaker, Dr. Jesse Trushensky. Well, that didn't work quite as, as planned. Let's try that again. Hopefully you all can hear me now, right? Yep, we can hear you. I think you just need to put your slides in the presentation mode. Yep. Oops, and that, we're seeing your notes. There we Here go. We, perfect. I had it all queued up, forgot to unmute myself. All right. Um, well, again, uh, thanks everybody. And um, let's go back to the beginning of the presentation here. Goodness gracious. Um, so uh, everyone else did such a wonderful job with the uh, technology. So leave it to me to really, uh, uh, screw it up at the end, but um, I, I really am, a, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to be here. Um, I wanna thank Kat and Emma for really setting the stage for uh, what I hope is gonna be a broader conversation about why fisheries and aquaculture, including recirculating aquaculture and land-based systems really matter uh, to the US. Um, so we're gonna start um, by talking about, um, you know, why aquaculture matters. And it, it matters because aquaculture supports fisheries and helps to perpetuate all of these real, tangible and intangible benefits that fisheries provide. Fish feed us, they provide us with jobs. They give us the chance to relax and reconnect with the natural world when we go fishing. Fish provide various ecosystem services and they're um, a really integral part of the natural and cultural legacies that we will ultimately leave to future generations. Why does aquaculture matter? Well, to answer that question, let's take a few minutes um, and remind ourselves about how aquaculture supports each of these aspects of fisheries. We've talked about this already a little bit tonight, but the world is hungry and it's increasingly hungry for protein. There are over 7 billion of us on the planet at this time. And over the next four decades or so, the human population may grow to more than nine and a half billion people. Now, based on that population growth, we need to be producing a lot more food. Specifically, we need to be producing a lot more animal protein. We need 60% more animal protein, including seafood, by the year 2030. 
When I first started presenting those statistics, maybe about 10 years ago, that didn't seem quite so dramatic. But now I look at the calendar and realize that's only eight years away. And we have a lot of ground that needs to be made up between now and when all of that food is needed. Again, it's important to recognize first and foremost, fish are food. Seafood is an essential source of nutrition throughout the world, providing protein and other key nutrients, oftentimes in places where those things are needed most. But even in places where food security is not as big of a challenge, seafood is still an important part of food culture. That's certainly true in the Pacific Northwest where I come from, um, but anyone that's been to a Friday night fish fry or a low country, so, uh, low country boil in the Southeast, knows that seafood holds pride of place in food culture pretty much anywhere you go. Now, up until the 1990s, the vast majority of our seafood came from the oceans. But today, more than 80% of fish stocks are considered fully exploited or in decline. Now, that terminology might seem a little strange, but what fully exploited means is harvested at the maximum sustainable limits. In other words, it's okay to keep fishing these fisheries the way that we are now, but we just can't harvest any more fish without damaging those populations. The bottom line is that we are unlikely to get more food from our oceans in the future. And in fact, we may get a bit less. So as uh, it's already been noted, aquaculture has emerged to grow this, um, to fill this growing seafood gap. And now half of all the uh, seafood that we, uh, that we consume comes from farms. Um, and that's a share that will only continue to grow. So we need to be thinking about food security, but we should also be thinking about the sustainability of food production. And um, the, the topic of food conversion ratios between terrestrial livestock and aquatic livestock has already been noted. Um, although I can see there's a few differences in, in numbers that we, we shared, I should probably update some of my stats for this slide as well. Um, but uh, regardless of minor differences in the actual numbers, the bottom line is that fish are the most efficient, um, capable of achieving nearly one-to-one -one conversions because they don't spend energy to maintain their body temperature the way that terrestrial animals do. Now, when we think about aquatic conservation, one of the most important variables is land use and how land use impacts watersheds and the, the water bodies that are formed by them. We could feed a couple billion more people with chicken, with pork, with beef, but if we're going to do that, it's going to mean a lot more feedlots and a lot more acres in crop production. And that has consequences for watersheds and fisheries. So aquaculture matters in terms of putting food on the table, but it also matters in terms of doing so without putting additional pressure on aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. Fish farms contribute to economic development, um, certainly in the, the commercial food fish sector, but so do the public hatcheries that produce fish for stock enhancement. Hatcheries are really essential now, and perhaps even more so in the future, for putting fish into the nets of anglers, of commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, and tribal communities. The US Fish and Wildlife Service has estimated that its national fish hatchery system, um, so these are the federal hatcheries, not the state programs, but those federal hatcheries support more than 8,000 jobs and 13.5 million angler days every year across the country. Recreational fishing is a major economic driver and a pretty good chunk of that is associated with federal and perhaps more importantly, state stocking programs. To give you a little bit of a context in terms of the federal versus the state programs, there's about 70 hatcheries across the United States that are part of the, the national or federal system. The state of Washington operates 70 hatcheries itself. So when you look at all of the different states and all of the different hatcheries that are, um, are operated across the country, there's a huge amount of infrastructure for supporting conservation and stock enhancement efforts, particularly on the state side of things. Now, in terms of commercial fisheries, the best examples come from Alaska, where hatchery origin fish um, can contribute really greatly to commercial catches of salmon. I'm glad we saw some of those brand new RAS facilities that have been um, put in there in, in the state programs. Um, depending on the year and depending on the species, hatchery fish can represent actually the bulk of what's harvested. Um, I think we all have this idea in our head of wild Alaskan salmon. Um, and there definitely are some populations, some stocks that, that don't receive hatchery inputs. But many of the fish that are caught and sold as wild Alaskan salmon actually started their lives in hatcheries. Aquaculture matters because it helps to keep recreational and commercial fisheries thriving, as well as helping the communities that rely on both of those types of fisheries. 
Now, I just mentioned the importance of aquaculture supported recreational fisheries in the context of economics, but recreational fishing is about more than just dollars and cents. We raise fish and stock them so that people can have experiences like these, spending a beautiful day on the water, feeling that tug at the end of the line, and remembering, hopefully, why it's important to conserve fisheries and wildlife, why it's important to maintain public lands and access, and so forth. Fishing is a part of cultural identity, and aquaculture matters because it helps to create and maintain fisheries in, in many cases, modified systems, so that future generations can enjoy fishing as much as these guys do. And remember too, that when anglers purchase, purchase fishing licenses, they stock their tackle boxes, they fuel their boats, they are supporting broader conservation efforts through the fees and the taxes that they pay. So aquaculture also matters for all the biological, social, and cultural reasons that recreational fishing matters. Now, while we're on the subject of recreation, I think it's worth noting that hatcheries are not just fish factories. They really make contributions well beyond that, well beyond the fish that they produce. Hatcheries are what I like to call the storefronts of aquatic resource conservation. For many of us, the very first fish that we caught was at a hatchery's fishing derby day. For many people across the country, the moment they started to care about fisheries resources was when they were six years old and standing elbow to elbow with a bunch of other kids and unceremoniously yanking a trout or a catfish out of a pond. More than fish and wildlife conservation offices, more than academic programs, more than most outreach programs, hatcheries really engage the public. They educate them, and they make them care about aquatic resources. It's obviously not their main job, it's not their mandate, but hatcheries do help to stem the tide of nature deficit disorder and relay the importance of fisheries um, and aquatic resources to generations of Americans that are increasingly disconnected from nature. Of course, anglers aren't the only ones interested in catching fish. Fish are a critical link in the food chain. And it's not something we often think about, but aquaculture matters because it helps to keep aquatic food systems and food webs functioning. This figure is, um, is illustrating some information from the West uh, where I'm at. Um, this figure shows the number of Chinook salmon smolts entering the Pacific Ocean along the US and Canadian borders. Um, and what you see are hatchery origin fish in the solid boxes at the bottom, and then uh, wild origin smolts uh, in the kind of hatched boxes at the, at the top. Now, without getting into the, the nitty gritty details here, what you can see from this figure is that since the 1970s, the number of smolts that are entering the ocean has increased. And that's good because that means these populations are rebounding. Um, but of course, when those populations reach the sea, they encounter a gauntlet of predators. And many of those smolts are eaten. Now, sure, the people that put a lot of effort and time and money into raising all of those hatchery origin smolts would probably prefer that they not end up directly into the gullet of a marine mammal, but that is part of how these creatures have co-evolved and how their populations have coexisted, whether they're wild or hatchery origin. A great many Chinook salmon and other salmon smolts are produced either by wild recruitment or in hatcheries to feed California and stellar sea lions and harbor seals and other marine mammals. Without the fish that we raise, populations of marine mammals like the ones that I'm showing you here would not have been able to rebound from their own population crashes that resulted from the loss of their wild origin prey. So aquaculture matters because it helps to conserve the fish themselves as well as the other species that rely on them. I wanna talk a moment about biodiversity and conservation efforts. It's been estimated that 99.9% .9 of all of the species that have ever lived on earth are now extinct. You've probably heard the phrase, it's better to be lucky than good. Um, and that may be true, but over the course of evolutionary time, that 0.1% of life that still exists, they've been both lucky and good. But for some of those species, their luck may be running out. Many fish will survive the current time, the, what we're calling the Anthropocene extinction event that we're currently in the midst of, but certainly not all fish will survive it. Some will go extinct. And in fact, many have already been lost. That includes more than 50 freshwater fish taxa, fish species in North America alone. Um, that, that's been over the last 100 years. Certainly more have been lost um, in the years prior to that. So that's a lot, that's a lot of extinction events. But it's safe to say that that number would have been substantially higher than 50 species lost over the last century had fish culturists not been raising fish 
in hatcheries in order to just keep those imperiled species alive and allowing them to continue to be. Without aquaculture, it wouldn't have been possible to rescue thousands of McLeod River red bands um, and other imp imperiled native salmonids from droughts that threatened to eliminate those fish from California waters. Without hatcheries, the Snake River sockeye salmon would have been relegated to history books a long time ago. Some of you may have heard the story of Lonesome Larry, the sole Snake River sockeye salmon that was returning one year and he had no one to spawn with. Um, and uh, Larry would have been uh, a long time gone had hatchery folks not been engaged in helping to uh, perpetuate and propagate this species. Because of hatcheries and the work of fish culturists, both of these iconic species and many others are, they exist and they're making modest but steady gains towards recovery. So again, aquaculture matters because maintaining biodiversity and natural legacies matters. As I said before, fish and fishing are really a part of who we are as people, almost regardless of where you are in the world. And as a result of that, fish figure really prominently in fables and myths and stories of peoples from around the world. Now, thanks to Marvel Comics, we all know about Thor, we know about his brother Loki, um, but you might not know about one of Loki's sons. Uh, his name is Jormungand, and according to, uh, to myth, he's an immense sea serpent. He's a giant fish, and it's actually this giant fish that Thor was supposed to battle at the end of Ragnarok. So they changed up the script of that movie a little bit relative to the original fables. Um, it, it really should have been a fish at the end of that movie. Now, according to Japanese myth, earthquakes are caused by the thrashing of a giant catfish that's trapped under the, the islands of, of Japan. Another uh, myth or another fable, most of us know the world's largest freshwater scaled fish. Um, it's the arapaima, some people call it the paiche, but in its native Amazonia, it's known as piruruku. Piruruku is the name of an indigenous warrior who is said to have been transformed into this fish as punishment for his cruelty and his vanity. Now, I know that some of these myths sound kind of silly and maybe a little bit hokey taken out of context, but Myths and fables are how we define and preserve our heritage. These stories of legendary fish help us to remember and communicate what's important to us and to tell others what we value. Without fish to catch, without fish to eat, and without fish to remind us of the infinitely humbling inner workings of, of nature, there are no fish tales. There are none of the indigenous peoples that rely on, on, on fish for their sustenance as well as a huge part of their culture. And it's not just indigenous people. Without fish, there are no you and me. Aquaculture matters because fish and cultural identity matter. So there's all these different reasons that fish matter, some of which we've talked about tonight, but there are of course many others. But fish and fisheries face a number of threats, not the least of which is climate change. Now, when people think about climate change, the images that are likely to, to come to mind are dry cracked earth and super storms and that um, kind of obligatory picture of the polar bear balancing on a melting iceberg. Those images come to mind because we can see and experience nearly all of those things happening around us right now. But fish and fisheries are also being impacted by climate change. So when you think about climate change, don't just think about polar bears and icebergs. You should also think about the images that I'm showing you on the screen too. Ocean acidification is causing numerous problems, including the loss of coral reefs. In this picture on the left, um, you can see just the ver very top of this stainless steel marker that was embedded in a block of, of coral in the Florida Keys in 1998. 17 years later, you can see how much of that same marker is now exposed. You could hardly see it before, and now almost the entire thing is sticking out of the, what remains of the reef. The reef is simply dissolving around it, and that's because of climate change and ocean acidification. Harmful algal blooms or HABs, like the one uh, that occurred on the Pacific coast a few years ago, this orange water picture here, those are becoming more severe and more widespread. In addition to kind of sucking all of the oxygen out of these affected systems, some HABs um, produce toxins that can harm aquatic life, and they can also be toxic to anyone consuming seafood from the affected region. Like HABs, dead zones are becoming more frequent and they're becoming larger and more persistent. And if oxygen levels drop for too low, drop too low for too long, um, of course, major mortality events can occur, not only killing fish, but other aquatic uh, organisms. 
Now, of course, we know that fish stocks are shifting to avoid these kinds of problems. Um, we see that with species like the Atlantic cod, uh, which I'm showing you their, their populations um, here in this, uh, this little uh, GIF here that's on the right side. Um, they're moving into more northern waters and they're moving into deeper waters in search of cooler temperatures. And that means that it's much more difficult to, to fish for those fisheries. Um, and it's also in some cases not possible because the populations have moved outside of the uh, traditional fishing grounds where uh, US vessels are allowed to operate. Even in circumstances when um, things aren't quite so dire as to kill fish outright or to cause entire populations of fish to move, that doesn't mean that fisheries aren't being affected. When we lose coral reefs, we lose the structure and habitat that species need for nurseries. Um, when fish are forced to cope with impaired environmental conditions, they have to expend energy on coping mechanisms. This means that the energy that they normally would have dedicated to foraging for food or avoiding predators or investing in reproduction, all of that is used up in the battle just to stay alive. Ultimately, what that means is smaller, weaker fish populations that are vulnerable to any number of threats, including climate change itself. So how can aquaculture help to stem the tide? Um, well, first, as I alluded to before, aquaculture does help us produce the additional food we need with a smaller carbon footprint, with less consumption of fresh water, particularly in the case of land-based uh, RAS systems. Um, and it can be done with reduced emissions of greenhouse gases, all of which is important. Second, aquaculture can be used as a multiplier to ensure that we use marine resources judiciously and stretch those resources as far as we can. Many of you have probably heard about fish in, fish out ratios or FIFO ratios that can be used as a measure of how efficiently the aquaculture industry uses wild resource inputs um, that are used in, in the product, production of feed. Now these calculations, these FIFO ratios can be quite misleading and sometimes they're misused. But if you just look at the big picture, the global FIFO ratios are about 0.4. That means that for every pound of wild fish that's used in feeds to feed farm raised fish, for every pound that goes in, you get two and a half pounds of farmed fish and shellfish out, more than doubling the amount of seafood that's available. Third, by closing the seafood gap, aquaculture is helping to divert harvest press pressure that would otherwise be applied to wild fisheries. As we've already seen, nearly all of the fisheries are already at, or perhaps in some cases, a bit beyond their limits. Um, and it's likely that they're going to be increasingly vulnerable to harvest pressure as a result of things like climate change. So aquaculture helps by relieving this added pressure, allowing us to, to meet that demand without decimating our fisheries. These are just a few of the ways that aquaculture can help. Fish farms, including the operations that you've heard a little bit about tonight, matter because they allow us to have our fish and eat them too. We should of course strive to manage fisheries so that they can support harvest and support consumption, but it's important that if we can't, if we can't do that for some populations, we have to meet that seafood demand in other ways. So the next time you're perusing a menu or the seafood case at a grocery store, I hope you choose farm-raised products because not only is farm-raised seafood good and good for you, choosing farm-raised fish helps to reduce harvest pressure and other impacts on the fisheries resources that we all value. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. And I believe now we're going to go into the Q&A. But for now, I'll turn things back over to Jennifer. All right, thanks a lot, Jesse, for that really expansive big picture look at where aquaculture fits in in the grand scheme of things. That was really interesting. Um, so now with the time that we have remaining, um, I hope that if people out there have questions, they'll go ahead and drop that in the chat box. Um, I'll just read your questions aloud and whichever panelist wants to can take your question. Um, so I'll give it a moment for people to type in questions. While we're waiting for that, I'll ask a question of my own. Um, I know one part of this big collaboration that Kat talked about um, is workforce development. And Emma touched upon it too, in terms of the kind of student training um, that the Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility up in Bayfield does. Um, as we look at kind of the growth of aquaculture, you know, for all these reasons that Jesse talked about, what are the challenges in workforce development? Um, and what are the kinds of jobs that exist in aquaculture? Um, you know, I think there's a real range of jobs, and I know I've heard some conversations about this before at a related conference that 
you know, there are some jobs that maybe don't require a full four-year college degree, you know, some that do. So, you know, just broadly speaking, what does the workforce picture look like and what needs to happen? So I'll throw that out there to anyone who wishes to answer. I can talk about it a little bit from, from our perspective at the facility. So um, when we train students, like I mentioned, we have internship programs, which is a summer internship uh, for college students. And then we also have a technician position, which is more of a, a limited term, but still year, year and a half to two year position. And we train them on definitely skills at the fish level. So raising fish, um, understanding different species, understanding different systems. Um, and water quality. So we kind of give a broad spectrum for a technician job at a facility. Um, that would be either a, a federal hatchery or a state hatchery or a commercial fish farm. Um, and because the facility has ponds and raceways and research systems, um, we can train them in a variety of different systems with the different species. So that's kind of a, a basic kind of starting technician position. So we try to train them so that they're prepared to go to more of a commercial setting. Um, but also there's many different jobs in aquaculture, like you mentioned, um, water quality is, is huge. So obviously the fish are, are living in their water. They, that has to be optimal. That has to make sure that it's a safe environment for them. So um, there's water quality specialists that work at different farms. And again, it depends on the size of the farm too. Um, but also we've heard from partners too, that, you know, even building control, so controlled like controlling the environment of your building. So like HVAC and, and heating and cooling and humidity. I mean, a lot of these systems, like Kat mentioned, they're all indoors. So all of that humidity, that degassing, all of that has to make sure it's maintained inside of that building. So um, it goes from technician raising fish to water quality, to plumbing, to uh, construction. I mean, it, it kind of, there's a whole world to aquaculture. It's a whole business. Um, but that's kind of from, from our perspective is training the students on the systems, the species, and kind of giving them that base. And then hopefully they learn a lot more when they move on. But um, Kat or Jesse, do you wanna, do you wanna input anything more? Sure, I'll just um, play off of what you just talked about there, Emma, a bit. Um, so Riverance, we are a fully integrated operation, uh, meaning that we have brood stocks, we produce our own eggs and genetics, um, we raise our fish, and we also process and distribute it. So um, if you, you know, it's absolutely true that you have just in the farming of fish, all of these different um, potential career paths. There's the fish culture aspect of it. There's the water quality that's been mentioned. There's um, fish health and diagnostics. There's feed development. There's all these other different aspects. And now you take that to a fully integrated operation where we have people that are dealing with processing and packaging and truck logistics and all of these other different aspects of, of producing food and getting it across the country. So um, yeah, it, it almost doesn't matter what your specific interests or aptitudes are. There's probably a way for you to, to find a career in aquaculture. And Riverance is hiring. <laughs> Um, I'll just add that, you know, as the extension associate on the project, and while I'm not a workforce development person, I get to be the conduit between all the different programs. And uh, at this time, it, we're kind of in the programming stage where each region has their own workforce development program, um, targeting different audiences. So here in Maryland, we have the Aquaculture and Action Program which targets secondary education and uses aquaculture to teach environmental literacy and aquaculture literacy. Um, in Maine, we have programming um, that places anyone that's, I mean, really uh, high school graduates, college undergraduates, really anybody who's interested, um, you can get credentialed um, in aquaculture. And, and at the end of it, you get, you know, you get to work, you know, in a facility and get real life experience in an aquaculture facility. So right now, as a nation, you know, we're working on our own individual programming. And in the future, what we hope to do is start integrating across the different regions and really using each other as a resource. Um, that will probably take some time, though. You can't do workforce strategy in just two years. It's a long haul. I see we have a question in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and take that one. Um, it basically comments on how, as all of you know, sometimes aquaculture can get a bad rap or have 
you know, negative perceptions surrounding it. Um, the commenter says that all of you presented great data tonight that counters that bad rap. Um, but do you have any tips for how other people, including lay people, um, can share these kinds of messages on the value and importance of aquaculture, you know, and what modern aquaculture actually is? So I can take a first stab at that, and then I'll look to Kat and Emma to pick up any of the things that I forget to mention. Um, but you know, I think um, first of all, I think a lot of folks have kind of an outdated view of what aquaculture is. Um, you know, like any um, animal production industry, um, when it was first being developed and practiced, there really wasn't a lot of emphasis necessarily on environmental impacts and management. Now, obviously we know better, and so now we do better. And that's true for aquaculture, it's true for poultry, swine, cattle, you name it. Everyone has a much more, um, a greater awareness of the importance and necessity of, of limiting environmental impacts. Um, but what I would say about aquaculture is that I think the most important thing in terms of environmental impacts and sustainability is that aquaculture isn't just one thing. Um, there is a type of aquaculture um, that makes sense pretty much wherever you are in the world. Now, do net, net, net pens make sense everywhere in the world? No, they don't. You need to have really deep water. You need to have good currents. You need to have certain environmental conditions to support that kind of aquaculture um, in a way that's environmentally friendly. Um, you know, do, do RAS make sense everywhere? Well, they, they do allow you a lot more freedom to be able to place them in, in environments that otherwise wouldn't be suited for um, different species, but you need to have a really stable electrical grid, which of course isn't something you have throughout the world. So RAS don't necessarily make sense everywhere. For our operations in Idaho, we've got a really great rearing system, but it doesn't work unless you have large volumes of cold water. Um, that are available um, and come out of the ground pathogen free. So again, none of these different types of rearing systems make sense unless you put them in the right context. So that's what I would say is that for, for people that are concerned about, okay, is aquaculture good? Is, it, is aquaculture bad? Um, the, the answer is it really depends. And aquaculture isn't just one thing. There's a way to do it right pretty much anywhere you are. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a not, it's not a one size fits all situation and it's not just one thing, you know, like other types of farming, there are many methods. Um, did anybody else want to address that question? I'll just note too, um, that when we get people that are confused about aquaculture, they tend to tag on to what they hear negatively and that that's what they remember. So I think the, there's a, desperate need for more education. So talking about how do we do aquaculture today? And I always tell people, go visit a farm. Um, come and visit us. We're open to the public. There's a lot of farms in Wisconsin that are open that you can go see. You can literally see how these fish are being raised. And that's not necessarily true for a lot of other agricultural entities. And it's because they want to share with you. There's no secrets. They want to share exactly how they raise their fish because they're proud of it. And um, they're proud of of raising fish because it's hard to raise fish. If you don't give fish the correct environment and the optimal environment, a lot of times they'll get sick or they'll die and that is your profit, that's your business. So um, I think education is huge. And that's again, why we're trying to reach out to students K through 12, not only um, because of future workforce development, but those are future consumers as well too. And, and just having a better understanding of how it's done, especially in the US is, is really crucial. And I'll follow up with that. Um, you know, this is a bit of an anecdote, but when I was living in Maine, um, I, you know, small town, everyone's kind of in the same spaces. So it was, you know, I kind of became the fish girl. People would come to me with questions. And one individual would just complain about how nasty like water looked, right? And I just, that wasn't my experience because I'm around those systems. I was around these net pens, for example, in Maine. I just didn't see the water they were talking about. And finally, I got out of her that the last time she had actually gone near those cages was like 20 years before. So, or like 15 years, like a, a really long time. So she had never gone back to visit. So using very outdated information to form an opinion. And, you know, she's talking to her friends, their friends are talking to their friends. And so you get the spread of misinformation that I think if you really critically Cons like a critically consuming um, information about aquaculture, I think is where this key um, is. This have an obvious bias. Is there anything, you know, positive being represented? You know, 
if you read something from aquaculture, we're going to admit, hey, this is something we're working on. We know it's not the best. Um, and so I just think being really critical of what you're consuming. I know there was a recent documentary on Netflix and um, some of the information presented was outdated or just completely misrepresented. Um, and so that's all I'll have to say is just being a critical consumer of your knowledge. Thanks everybody. Um just to kind of piggyback on what Emma said in terms of visiting a farm in Wisconsin, I just want to put out a plug for a project of Wisconsin Sea Grant called Eat Wisconsin Fish. So if you go to eatwisconsinfish.org, we have a lot of information there about Wisconsin fish producers, um, both commercial fishing and fish farms. And so if you're wondering, you know, well, where is a fish farm in Wisconsin that I could ask to go visit? Um, if you take a look at eatwisconsinfish.org, you'll find some of that information about places you could contact and try to go visit. Um, we're getting short on time here, but I'm hoping that everybody can hang out for a few more moments because we are getting some more questions in the chat. So is everybody okay with hanging on for just a little bit? Okay, all right. Um, I have a question here from Claude, and the question is, I live in the Great Lakes area. When I shop for fish, all the farm-raised fish are from Chile or China. How can I farm, or excuse me, how can I find farm-raised fish nearby? So again, I think I would point to something like eatwisconsinfish.org. There's also a Sea Grant affiliated site called Eat Midwest Fish that has a bigger span that they're looking at. Um, but Emma, do you wanna pick up on this? Because I know you know this context very well. Yeah, and, and a lot of our, well, a few of our partners are actually shipping um, their, their products as well too, so I check into that. So um, like Superior Fresh ships their, their fish products. Um, and also go to your local um, markets, especially if they're producing local um, or have local products and ask them, is there a way you can get farm-raised fish here or is there an option? And, and if they know that there's a demand for it, um, they might search it out in the future. And it is, sometimes it is hard to find um, because especially in Wisconsin here, we're not, you know, there's not a ton of farms doing food, food fish, but I would def definitely go to websites like Eat Wisconsin Fish or ask around. There might be an extension agent that knows in your, in your area as well too. Um, but again, mention it to your, to your markets and, and see if they can get it for you. Thanks, Emma. Um, I'm going to move on to a question that we have here that is directed at Kat. Um, and the question is regarding the areas of RAS that need improvement, which one do you think is the most critical to the success of the industry and technology? So there are a lot of ways to answer that question. Um, as an extension associate and having done a survey, actually, I can share, uh, I added some graphics. So, you always have your backup slides at the end. <laughs> um, so I think the first way I'll answer this is from just the perspective of industry stakeholders themselves. I mean, the whole, you know, the whole network contributed their um, views. And, and so we did a survey of technical needs and um, the top eight, uh, are presented here. And what you might see a lot of is this repetition of off flavor as well as early maturation. Um, and so those are just examples of some of the biological challenges in RAS um, that are currently being addressed through uh, multiple research institutes. Uh, I'd say that at this time, that is of highest priority. Now, as an extension person who talks to a lot of people, I think that the need for improvement is more on the public perception front. You know, we just had a question about the bad rap that aquaculture gets. And so my bias is less towards the biological technical needs and more to the people side. Um, and that's just because I'm a, that's where I work. I work on the people side. Um, but we have, you know, Jesse, I don't know if you'd like to provide input or Emma, but I, those are, that would be my response. Yeah, I think what you said is right, Kat, that there's, you know, there's a, a fundamental need for better, better conversations, more informed conversations about aquaculture. And, you know, the, the technological um, uh, challenges are, are real. 
um, but they are solvable. And you know, I think what's what's really incredible is to see how RAS has developed over a really short time frame, right? So many of the things that that we're talking about and implementing right now um, to you know address biofiltration or to address um, you know the the rearing environment and making it optimal for species that we never thought were were really going to be a good fit for RAS. It's all happening now, and really, there, it's not like we're talking about a hundred years of development here for RAS. It's all happened in um, in really just a decade or two, and so um, and I think that that innovation is accelerating as well. So um, yes, there are definitely technological challenges, but there are solutions there. Um, and again, I would agree that the uh, the perception part of it is probably the the more unwieldy problem to to address. Well, I think at this point, we've covered the questions that came in through the chat. So I just want to thank everybody again and also respect your time and not go too far past the eight o'clock hour. Um, but this has been really enlightening because, you know, from Emma, we had this look at research and training that happens right here in Wisconsin in a place that maybe not everybody knows is there, you know, this hub of cutting edge research in the in far northern Wisconsin, right near Lake Superior. And then CAD kind of took us through the ins and outs you know, of what I think is a very complex process. It's kind of fascinating to think how many things go into a RAS operation. And then, you know, Jesse's very expansive big picture look at why all of this matters and all the kind of unexpected ways that aquaculture touches other things like conservation and even recreational fishing in ways that people may not necessarily realize. So I think this has been a really nice, you know, well-rounded panel because each of you have you know, a different angle on this issue. So this has been just really great and I'm glad you were able to do this tonight. So thank you to everyone who tuned in and thank you, of course, to Emma, uh, Kat and Jesse for being with us tonight. And I'm sure if you have questions after the presentation, you can get in touch with them and I'm sure they'd be happy to speak with you. But thanks so much for joining us on your St. Patrick's Day to do this talk. Um, and as I mentioned before, we'll put this on the YouTube channel for Wisconsin Sea Grant in the near future. Um, but thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.